Those Days with the Monsters, Part 13. Kirol Nakte, Liaison to the Cumans, Report 10. Do you remember when I asked you to please, for the love of stars, hurry with the microbe problem? Well, what I was worried about is happening. The Cumans, especially the captain, are restless. Doc says he sent the information they got back from their boots on the ground to the department already. He's pretty angry that we haven't heard anything back yet, and he says his oxygen threat is still on the table. I don't see how it's a threat, since anything he says would have to be said in oxygen, but yeah, he seems pretty unhappy with the department. I don't know what exactly he means to do about it, but he certainly sounds like he means to do something. So, could you respond soon, please? The Cumans are hot-tempered. Kirill paused, his frills flushing faintly purple. I assume you knew that, though. The Tizic situation showed the whole galaxy how hot-tempered they can be. He considered mentioning that half the reason the Cumans were so irritated was because of the Tizic situation, as he had put it, but decided against it. I don't know if you can see, but Doc is actually sitting behind me right now. Kirill glanced behind him, shifting the holopad so the recording could see. He said he wants to give the stink eye to whoever is holding onto his data. I don't know what exactly that means, but he's giving me chills. About the- Ah, uh, Kirill. Could I interrupt? Doc interjected, standing. Kirill felt himself flinch back slightly at the look on Doc's face. I don't think I can stop you from interrupting he replied, attempting not to squeak nervously in the recording. He'd seen that look a few times on the Cumans, and it was never, never good. Thank you. Doc shifted the holopad. After a moment or two of trying, he got it to focus on his face. Kirill felt his heart pounding in the burning look in Doc's eyes. Now listen up. I don't know exactly how this inner species affairs thing works, so I'm trying to give you a little bit of face. You are making it so hard. Kirill didn't understand giving face, but tucked it away for later. In the middle of a report was not the time, especially not when Doc looked this angry. The Tizix issue was out of hand. We're pretty much lurking on the edges of human territory, and they're already trying to prey on ships. There needs to be a solution, and soon. I don't think you want a human solution, so find a way to talk to us about this. Because if we don't get a response soon, we're going to consider it abdication of responsibility, and then the humans get involved. And I don't think you want that. It tends to upset the nice, manageable political situation you have going on over there. <sighs> Doc sighed, but it wasn't a sigh of defeat. It was more like he was reminding himself to be patient the fury still bright in his eyes. I've said my piece, if anything happens, it's on you. He returned to his seat and gestured to Kirill, who looked back to the holopad and shifted himself into focus again. As you can see, the, uh, the Cumans are not taking well to the lack of response. I don't know what they intend to do, but they intend to do it, and soon. The captain has been shouting at people much more often than he used to, and Doc... Well, you can see that he's not pleased either. I know they're on official contact only status, but this could be considered official contact. I would almost think it should be official contact, but I know it's more complicated than that. I'm sure I just don't understand it, as a cargo jockey. I won't try to overstep, but I'm meant to be cultural liaison, and I'm not even a very good one. Please give me something I can work with. Doc made a sound that Kirill's translator interpreted as either amusement or disgust. Well, that wasn't comforting. Kirill swiped a claw over the holopad, saving and sending the report. He would probably be in trouble when the report came through, but he wasn't exactly somewhere where he could spend his pay anyway, so if they docked it for letting a Cumin barge in on his report it really wouldn't affect him much. A quiet ticking sound alerted Kirill to the fact that he was clicking one claw nervously against the desk. He seemed to have dug a small hole there. Oh, how... Doc, how long was I poking holes in the desk? Hmm, I'd say since about when I interrupted you. Not a surprise, exactly. 
Kirill sighed. Not a patiently angry sigh like the docks, but a nervous one. Sorry. For what? For putting a hole in your desk. It's your desk now, man, Doc said, a bit more emphatically than he usually spoke. But, hey, stop that squishy. Doc's tone tolerated no argument. Even as Kirill's frills flared wide and turned a deep crimson at his sharp tone. That's your desk. You do whatever you want with it. You could smash it if you wanted to, and I wouldn't get a say. He put a firm hand on Kirill's shoulder. You're not allowed to apologize for little things like that anymore. You hear me? I don't know what's little and what isn't. Kirill closed both eyelids, his frills pulsing yellow. You're a completely new species. I still don't know anything. Well then, anything that's contained in your quarters and doesn't involve anyone else in the crew probably counts as little. Let's start with that. Carol sighed, nodding. I see. I'll try to remember that. I didn't mean to make you explain it. I'm sorry. For just a second, Doc's face seemed almost angrier than it had before, but then he bared his teeth affably. You seem to think about things better when you're trying to tell someone else. Have you thought about using a journal? A journal? Carol considered carefully. He had seen some of his clutch mates doing it on their holopads, but it had never made sense to him. Nothing was ever different, so what was the point? I haven't really thought about it. I know some from my species do it, and they seem to find it relaxing, but I never really tried it. Well, I'll send you a journal. I think I have a blank one. Doc paused on his way out of the door and added, By the way, Sleep is said to meet him on the wreck deck if you have time. Said he had something he wanted to show you. Carol wasn't about to say no. Not when Doc had looked so terrifying during his report. Sure, I'll be right there. Suddenly, Carol felt his heart sink. Doc, what you said in the report, you don't think they'd charge me with that, do you? Well, uh... Doc made a strange face that Carol's translator interpreted as a combination of guilt, awkwardness and mild worry. I don't think they can make the charge stick, no. They might shout at you, though. Sorry about that. Carol shook his head, teal confusion glancing off his scales. Doc, you said not to apologize for little things. This isn't a little thing, though. Carol gave up understanding what Cummins considered little things, and instead went to the wreck deck. Hello, Sleepy. Hey, a space mayor. Got something for you. Sleepy flopped down in a long, soft chair and patted the seat. Sit down. I figure you ought to know what's going on when we say these nicknames, so, yeah. When you meet FG, you should know who she is and all. A swell of music heralded the beginning of a presentation of some sort on the projector. But this presentation was a story. Carol tried to pay attention. He really did. But the long hours working with Alex and the worrisome reports he'd had to make had left him exhausted, and eventually he fell asleep. For a moment he woke up to see two animated Cummins moving in circles to music, and felt his frills pulse teal and fuchsia. What are they doing? He mumbled. Ah, you woke up. They're dancing. This is dancing? When the, the Tizix came... Why did the captain say to dance? Kirill's species had some types of rhythmic movement they would do at celebrations, or during the courtship process. But since they didn't use it for any sort of attack, he'd assumed it was a mistranslation. But this was dancing? This scene and the scene on the bridge had nothing in common. In his tired state, Kirill found himself feeling somewhat annoyed at human language for being so incomprehensible. Kirill heard Sleepy making the Cumin amusement sounds as he fell asleep again, but he didn't get to hear the reply to his question. As he dropped into the dark, he could still faintly hear the music going, and he thought there might have been a head pat. He wouldn't remember later, but the last thought before he fell fully asleep was how embarrassing head pats really were.